Ma'at is the goddess of justice as she and her scale balance between one's heart and a feather, and if yours weighed more than the feather then you were met with the dark afterlife. But if your heart was equal to the feather you would continue your journey into the afterlife. As for the principles of Ma'at, she had 42 laws that of the ancient Egyptians would follow if most, as there were other tribes as well who had their own following, had a specific distinction in society. Most if not all were pretty reasonable, but one in one of their 42 rules was a little odd. The rule was, I have not felt sorrow without reason. The rest of the rules were pretty great as it includes I made no one cry today, I have not stolen food from a child, I have not stolen anyone's land, I have not polluted the water. Those are pretty great rules. But the not have felt sorrow without reason does borderline on the whole mental health set of things. Unless you're melancholy all the time, the concept of mental health was still a foreign concept and even now, there are still people who do not believe it to be a rational feeling. As times go on in this law in particular, perhaps was not only referencing to the sake of ancient Egyptian mental health, but if someone was feeling depression or anxious or just not normal, they might have been ostracized or even looked with disdain. Number 9. Fines I mean the concept of fines came pretty prevalent in these times, especially if theft and burglary occurred, which as we know, grave robbing was pretty common. With that being said, the court had no power to ensure the judgement was fulfilled and instead actually relied on social pressure. The guilt had to be admitted and the judgement would be accepted. Oracles of the gods could also be approached to judge cases, so the assailant or the assumed accused, the penalty for stealing the property of individuals was up to paying a fine of 2 or 3 times the stolen object. Object, which sounds pretty decent or very precedent in regarding of current times. As for theft of public property, however, as an example, the thief would be told to pay up to 180 times the amount of the stolen goods or goods in general. The accused would be ordered to return the stolen goods after his full confession, which by the way, as we understand in some cases, are beaten out of them, and they would be subjected to be beaten again anyway by 100 strokes by hand and swearing an oath or thrown into a river for crocodiles to eat, and the sentence would be sentenced in full public display for everyone to see. Number 8. Bribery Clause If you were caught bribing, especially if you were in state administrative work, you would be 100% brought to trial and punished. And by punished, punished by dismissal from office and your status would just be turned into a farmer. Bribery played a negative role in crippling the entire administrative process to the point where the government clerks would steal a file approving the conviction of one of the accused from the judicial archives. Many criminals like thieves and grave robbers of the tomb of a king during a reign of Ramesses IX were freed after paying said bribe. So even if the laws in ancient Egypt were pretty intense and a strict notion of punishment of being caught. Seems like if you were in a high political office and you were caught bribing, not much would happen to you and you would be sent to court as an equal punishment like that of a civilian. You would just be turned into a civilian. Just like seeing a, pol a politician who runs for political office and them losing and then seeing them at Walmart the next day. Oh how the mighty have fallen. But it's not a surprise someone in high positions would just get a slap on the wrist, or even in this case just a demotion. Number 7. Infidelity Like in most societies, adultery or infidelity has always been looked down on. In ancient Egypt, adultery was considered a religious crime. The death penalty was also looked into this as used to prevent the spread of immortality in society. In the teachings of Fatah Hutub, he warns not to be fascinated by women and be careful from approaching women as that's why thousands of men were perished. It's because of women's fault. When it comes to adultery with married women, it was a crime of deserving death as it is easier to commit any other sin after that. So you can't commit another crime if you're dead. And if the crime is caused by a married woman, then her husband has the legal right to forgive or punish his wife or just leave it to the court to punish the wife with no proof. The punishment of the man who was a lot more lighter than the women of the ancient Egyptians felt the offense of a promiscuous woman was more of her fault. While the women would be suffering several deaths, the men would just suffer severe beatings. And including the Ma'at's 42 laws, it is also mentioned, I have not seen seduced anyone's wife on the list, but if you do seduce, you are met with punishment. Just like the other way around on seducing husbands, just like Mae West once said, why don't you find a single one and leave the husbands alone? Number 6. Penalty for Treason In life and all of human history, nothing is more vile than treason. Treason of one's family, one's friendships, treason to your nation, and even treason to yourself. But in ancient Egyptian times and law when it comes to treason, it was met with one and only option and that was death, execution style. And this was the only imposed penalty regarding the social status of the accused, especially if the majority of the defendants were close to the king. When King Ramses III chose an heir to his throne, and this created a jealousy amongst his wives, especially a middle class wife called T, who plotted to assassinate him to make her son the king. The wife and all the conspirators were caught, prosecuted, and punished. And considering there were no cemeteries for anyone to commit a crime against the majesties, the bodies would just be thrown into the river for the crocodiles to eat. Number 5. Forced Confession 
In ancient Egypt, they had a well put together system of laws and a group that essentially acted as police. But that doesn't mean things were really all that fair. Just like in older European societies, forced confessions out of people was incredibly common. In fact, it was basically standard practice. Usually to elicit confessions, people would be whacked with sticks, often on the bottom of the feet. Those who were forced into confessing were expected to not only admit to what they did, but explain where anything they stole might still be hidden and rat out every single one of their accomplices. Then, the same practice could be applied to those accomplices. Unfortunately, like many imperfect legal systems, it will never be possible to quantify just how many innocent people may have been punished for a crime because they were forced into confessing, something that they didn't do. Sadly, false confessions under this method are an incredibly common phenomenon because people will do almost anything to just make it stop. Number four, just leave her alone. When a man passed away in ancient Egypt, he was embalmed right away. Women, on the other hand, were a different matter. By law, the beautiful and the powerful weren't sent to embalmers until they had been in the afterlife for three to four days. This was all because nobody trusted the embalmers. This wasn't just paranoia though. It was something that the Egyptians learned the hard way. An embalmer left in charge of mummifying a royal body was caught in the act by a coworker. We learned this from the following passage in Herodotus, which you can take with a grain of salt if you want to, but it went like this. Quote, the wives of men of rank when they pass are not given at once to the embalmed, nor such women as are very beautiful or of greater regard than others, but on the third or fourth day after their passing and not before, they are delivered to the embalmers. They do so about this matter in order that the embalmers may not, I'll just leave the rest up to your own imagination. Number three, crocodile dung. The ancient Egyptians were the first society we know of to create birth control. However, this birth control was not in the form of pills or little rubber things. Instead, the Egyptians turned to crocodiles, specifically their rear ends. To avoid pregnancy, the ancient Egyptians mixed honey and crocodile dung and then inserted that lovely mixture into the holiest of holies before any of the fun began. The reason for this is possibly that the acidity of crocodile poopy is considered to be effective at eliminating a man's microscopic soldiers of fortune. That is the best way I could have said that. Number two, Hippobitamus. Surprisingly little is known about the life of the boy pharaoh Tutankhamun, but some historians believe they know how he got a ticket to the afterlife. Scans of the young king's body show that he was embalmed without his heart or his chest wall. This drastic departure from traditional Egyptian burial practices could suggest many different things, but one hypothesis is that he may have suffered a horrific injury prior to his passing. According to a handful of Egyptologists, one of the most likely causes for this wound would have been a bite from a hippopotamus. Now, I don't know if you know, but hippos are actually extremely dangerous. But evidence indicates that the Egyptians hunted the beasts for sport, and statues found in King Tut's tomb even depict him in the act of throwing a harpoon. If the boy pharaoh was indeed fond of stalking the dangerous game, then the end of his life might have been the result of a hunt gone wrong. And finally, in at number one today, Kitty Shield. It's no secret that ancient Egyptians were obsessed with cats and even worshiped them. When a cat lays down to its eternal rest, every member of the mourning family would shave their eyebrows in sorrow. If someone took the life of a cat, they were thrown into a poisonous snake pit, rightly so. After a cat passed on, it was mummified and buried in the cat cemetery with a bowl of milk next to it to prevent them from being thirsty in the afterlife. They also trained them to be vicious exterminators of pests that infiltrated food storage, allowing an agricultural society to dominate the Mediterranean. This was great. I love cats too, but it may have actually been part of the reason the Egyptians suffered a horrible defeat. Cats were so precious that when the Persians showed up using cats as shields, the Egyptians retreated in fear of taking the life of a cat. So the Persians took out tons of soldiers, the pharaoh, and took over the rule of Egypt. Kicking off our list at number 10, ancient Egyptian eyeliner. Whenever you see hieroglyphics or any art depicting the great pharaohs, they're usually rocking some impressive eyeliner. They look great, right? Like a 90s pop star, they look awesome. Ancient Egyptians were the OG eyeliner users. They made their own eyeliner from lead salts. And no, before you think about getting creative, do not try this at home. This wasn't an ideal process. See, for starters, these salts were quite high in lead concentration. So in order to avoid that mess, ancient Egyptians first had to process and then filter that lead salt for up to 30 days in order to get the lead levels low enough to even be applied. So you had to plan accordingly. They're like, oh, I have a pharaoh date in 30 days. Perfect. We'll start now. It was a hazard if done incorrectly. Not only was this ancient beauty practice, well, beautiful 
to look at, but Egyptians also needed eyeliner to protect against sun damage, as well as fight off any infections. Yeah, we don't encourage rubbing lead on your eyes today. We have a few different methods on, you know, how to look good. I think. None of them include lead, hopefully, ideally. Number nine, hair gel. Back in my day in high school, I had to use Dippity Doo Extra Hold Hair Gel. Yeah, I showed a scale on the side. I always got the five out of six hold. That was good. Six was too much. Nobody ever did the full six. That's crazy talk. But in ancient Egypt, we didn't have styling, spiking glue, and blasting free spray by DJ Polly D. No, we have that today, unfortunately, but back then, a little different. Back then, ancient Egyptians loved styling their hair, but again, before DJ Polly D was born, what is a pharaoh to do? If the Great Pyramids are any indication, they knew something that we didn't. Ancient Egyptians knew how to keep their hair in one place all day long. And that heat too, how do you do it? My curls, I'm jealous. Their hair styling gel was made with shea butter and coconut oil. But more often than not, they would replace coconut oil with almond oil. So this was a completely natural and strengthening styling gel. Cut to today, we have whatever that is. Psst, ice spray, that's awesome. DJ Polly. psst. No. Number eight, coffee scrub. I love coffee. I don't think I love coffee enough to do a coffee face scrub, but hey, never say never. I'll try anything once. Ancient Egyptians would use coffee scrub to reduce inflammation, improve blood circulation, and since it's a ground up material, it's gonna remove those dead skin cells at the same time. Next holiday season, grab your aunt some coffee scrub. Just tell her how it reduces puffiness, improves the skin's texture, all that good stuff. It'll give you that youthful feral look that you've been going for, you know what I mean? Merry Christmas, here you go, coffee on your face. Using grounded coffee powder to exfoliate your skin sounds like a new idea. It's certainly a hot trend today. But before TikTok, ancient Egyptians already knew these benefits. Damn, I'm gonna get a coffee scrub. Maybe I'll do it, I don't know. After I'm done this cup, I'll just rub it on my face, on my desk, and see what uh, everyone says. Number seven, dead sea salt. You'll never feel more alive than when you use dead sea salt. Here we go. Ancient Egyptians were ahead of the exfoliation game. Dare I say, they invented it. Not only were coffee scrubs a necessity, but salt from the dead sea was one of the most popular ancient Egyptian skincare products ever. We traveled far and wide for this one. Salt collected from the Dead Sea was used to exfoliate dead skin cells, and it was so well known at this point that rumor has it, Cleopatra herself would travel all the way to the Dead Sea from Egypt just to take a bath. Yeah, let's be honest, after this point, we'd all love a rejuvenating Dead Sea float. That sounds way better than what I've got at home. Well, bath probably can't even fit in this thing. Dead Sea sounds way better. I once left a house party early to go have a bath. Sort of God, York University. Dipped at like 10 o'clock. I was like, I'm cold, I'm not doing this. 40 minute walk, worth it. Leave your friends for a bath, do it. Number six, wax cones. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. You've probably seen them in a thumbnail here at some point. The art depicting head cones is quite unique looking. It's like a pharaoh with a triangle on their head. You're like, what's happening there? What is this? Was like Illuminati? What is this? Long before Pantene Pro-V, when it came to head cleanliness, these triangular wax cones were here to save the day. And they looked pretty fun to use, I don't know. They would just sit on top of your head. You didn't need to mix anything with lead for 30 days or brain or anything like that. You don't need to put any organs in jars, just a wax cone atop of your head. Easy. Back in 2019, experts found archeological evidence that they were in fact used. So yeah, not just a glyph real life history. So I have to bring this up. Men and women alike would wear this cone and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone down and through your hair. The cone itself was made of oils, fat, resin. It would be placed on their wig or directly onto your head and it would keep melting and refreshing all day long. Like a little candle almost. A nice little human candle. Nice little Egyptian man candle. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. It's a little easier nowadays. I'm too tall too. I can't have a wax cone. Are you kidding me? It would hit this mic. No way. Number five, the plow. Back in the day when we started to move away from the hunter-gatherer lifestyle to more of a work the land and make a new farm lifestyle, Omari would go out into the field with his hoe and cultivate his land by hand. As you can imagine, this takes a hell of a long time, but we're a problem-solving species. That's why we got to where we are now. Enter the plow and the evolution of agriculture. So basically, you take your two favorite oxen and you connect them together and you connect them to a beam of wood that shoots out behind to the plow handle and to the blade of the plow that would go into the ground and be dragged behind by the ox, breaking up the ground. All the farmer has to do is sow the seed. This simple invention changed everything and it's still used in places where machinery is just unaffordable. Number four, the calendar. No one would blame you if in the last two years you forgot what day it was. I know after spending a lot of time inside, I forgot what day it was, but every day is a Saturday when you eat spicy chicken wings in your tidy whities Well, the Egyptians may have had one of the first calendars and a gosh darn good one too. Their calendar had 12 months and over 300 days. The trouble is after a while it kind of got a little inaccurate. 
they did their best to fix it. I mean, clearly, if you look at the calendar, I mean, clearly it's the it's the fifth of, uh, well, I think that looks like three men walking in sand. And next month we have a special festival happening. It looks like it'll be a sunny day on the 12th of uh, man with ball on, on his hat. H hieroglyphs are hard, man, I don't know. Number three, clocks. All right, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you the Egyptians invented the modern clock, no. But they did have to tell time, and as any dad or survival guru will tell you, the most reliable way to tell what time of the day it is would be that massive floating ball of plasma in the sky, the sun. Assuming it isn't a super cloudy day or anything. The obelisks we see in Egypt were not just fancy deco pieces. They were actually sun clocks, used to see how the sun would cast shadows throughout different times of the day. They even used it to figure out which days were longer and shorter. There was an even more interesting clock though, a water clock. It was basically a stone vessel with a tiny little hole at the bottom which allowed water to drip at a constant rate. The water marks spaced out at different levels would tell you how many hours had passed. This one's good because it worked at night and on cloudy days as well. Number two, mummification. Welcome back to the land of the living, my friend. You've been gone for quite some time. <laughs> oh. Yes, the process of mummification, probably the number one thing ancient Egypt is known for, maybe besides the pyramids. While not the only civilization of the past to practice this, they kind of ran the show here. Basically, the pharaoh's corpse has to stay fresh so their soul can make it into the afterlife. The heart stays, but everything else is like a furniture after a bad divorce. It must go. The brain was stirred up like a family reunion square dance and drained like last night's punch bowl. But wait, horror fans, there's more. Lungs, liver, bladder, intestines, stomach, kidney, and basically anything you can scoop out with your favorite ice cream scoop is going. But don't toss them out though. Some of these organs were preserved in jars. Makes nice decorations beside the piles of gold found in the tombs. Yes, my liver jars. Oh, yes. Number one, cosmetic makeup. The ancient Egyptians created makeup as far back as 4000 BC. That's a long time ago. And that's how long we've been obsessed with our looks. Yikes. Their makeup actually served more of a purpose than just looking good though. The eye makeup they used specifically was believed to cure eye diseases, which wasn't true, and would protect them from the evil eye, which, I don't know, could have been true. Kind of like the ink, they would use soot, but they would combine it with a lead mineral called galena to create a black substance they called coal. That's K-H-O-L, not C-O-A-L. They had multiple colors actually. They would make green makeup by combining malachite with galena. Now, if you saw our bizarre beauty products and history video, you probably know that lead, even lead minerals like Galena, aren't really great for you. But hey, anything in the name of looking good. We're gonna start with the latest and the greatest. Number 10 is the latest Saqqara discoveries. So on January 26th of 2023, after a year long excavation of the notorious Saqqara necropolis, two ancient tombs that date back to the fifth and sixth dynasty of the Old Kingdom are unveiled to the public. Zahi Hawass, who isn't my favorite person to cite, gave a statement on one of the mummies found. Kanohe de Defe was a inspector of officials, supervisor of nobles, and a priest in the pyramid complex of Unas. Mehdi had many titles, one of them being the Keeper of Secrets, which is a title you'll hear again later in this video. This would also be a great time to take a second and subscribe to The Hive if you're a fan of discoveries such as these. Also found was a stone sarcophagus with a mummified man named Fatek, but the most important of the dusty corpses found was a gold leaf covered mummy. Hekashepis was found down a 15 meter burial shaft inside a large rectangular limestone sarcophagus. While other mummies have been found with this unusual coding choice, Hekashepis gets to take Seniority. This mummy is the oldest complete mummy covered in gold, Hawass said in an interview, having led the excavation himself. The excavation team also found dozens of other valuable artifacts, including statues, some of which still have their original paint intact, as well as amulets, coins, earrings, rings, and tablets, all of which are currently being displayed at the Step Pyramid of Hauser in Saqqara. Number nine is the tomb special of collecting crocs. Archaeologists excavating the Thebian necropolis in Egypt made an extraordinary but unusual discovery which was announced on December 20th of 2022. Nine crocodile heads placed inside two tombs belonging to high ranking nobles. Archaeologist Patrick Chudzik told the Newsweek that the discovery was the first of its kind as crocodile remains have never been discovered inside the tombs of Egypt despite usually being found inside of temples or special catacombs. Dr. Chudzik explains in our case 
things are different. Firstly, only the heads and not the entire bodies of these Nile reptiles have been, have been deposited in these tombs where we work. Secondly, they were not mummified, only wrapped in linen. There is a significant difference in this as no preservatives were used. Finally, the remains were found in the tombs of humans, not catacombs of sacred animals. The tombs belonged to two top officials during the reign of the pharaoh Nehefetre, Mentohalpet II, one being the Chancellor Cheti, a high official, but the occupant of the second tomb is actually still anonymous to us. Placing of the crocodile heads in the tombs, according to Dr. Chadzek, certainly was unusual, but not entirely unprecedented. He believes that earlier researchers paid scant attention to such finds that depict cultural practices, but weren't treasures, stating that it's likely similar offerings had been placed in quite a few other tombs of rich individuals, but those offerings were discarded by the earlier researchers who discovered them. Number 8 is about the Ramesid Cemetery. So in April of 2023, the joint Dutch-Italian archaeological mission of the Saqqara archaeological site discovered the tomb of a person called Banhishia from the Ramesid period, the chief servant of the tomb of a ten. Alongside his tomb was the discovery of four small chapels, reinforcing the previous theories that suggest the reuse of the space between the tombs of the 18th dynasty in later eras and the constructions of tombs and chapels in that area during the Ramesid period of Egypt. The cemetery is a self-contained temple, having its own entrance and inner courtyard as well as an underground burial chamber. Oddly, out of two out of those four chapels I mentioned were in dedication of a person that they don't recognize called Yo-Yo. Endless inscriptions and scenes on the walls are distinguished by their accuracy and quality of detail. One in particular shows a scene of funerary procession of Yo-Yo and the process of reviving his mummy again in the hereafter to live in the afterlife as a god, in addition to a scene depicting the cow goddess Hathor and a boat of the god Sekera, the god of the underworld. Inside the tomb, the mission found a stella picturing of Banhasi and his wife Baya, the singer of Amun, before a table of sacrifice and several drawings of priests and animals. While some have warriors, others have the terracotta inscriptions, which is number seven. The Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and, Inqui and Antiquities announced another discovery in Saqqara, March 17th, 2022. As the title of the video reveals, it's very obviously tombs, specifically five of them. All burials date to either Old Kingdom or the first transition slash intermediate period, roughly 4,700 to 4,000 years ago. All belong to top officials and dignitaries from respective time periods and are in good state of preservation. Eity, one of the top nobles of the court, had a well-defined pathway leading to his burial room with the walls adorned with engraved pictures of many funeral scenes painted in bright terracotta and sandstone. Artistically, the colors of the paintings are considered royal colors by officials. Grave number two belonged to the wife of a man named Yart. Meanwhile, grave number three belonged to a person named Bobby Fadahafe, who used to occupy several important court positions, namely supervisor of the great house, the chanting priest, and the cleaner of the house. The fifth cemetery is a man called Hanu, who had many titles, such as the mayor, and the sixth grave, however, is the most interesting of them, as it has the archaeologist a little giddy. A woman called Betty, who was responsible for the king's makeup, appearance, and dressing, and was buried with tons of her cosmetic tools. Allegedly, she is also a priestess of Hathor, who's the goddess of love, beauty, music, fertility, and pleasure. You want to hear something crazy? Number six is how they cracked open a tomb and found a hundred sealed coffins. It was announced on the 14th of November 2020. It's the largest find of that year. It's a hundred sealed coffins and over 40 statues alongside hundreds of mixed artifacts. Naturally, they're discovered at the Saqqara necropolis and carbon dating tells us that the items date back to the Ptolematic dynasty that ruled Egypt for some 300 years from about 320 BC to 30 BC and the late period. The coffins were found inside a burial shaft that had not been opened at all for 2,500 years. The preliminary studies revealed quickly that most of these coffins belonged to 26th dynasty priests, top officials, and elites. A number of wooden statues and colored gilded masks were also found, all in really great condition, and 28 of the statuettes are of Pates Sokar, the main god of the Saqqara necropolis. But there's one very special and unusual statue in this tomb, a bronze statue of the god Nefreta. The statue is inlaid with valuable precious stones. We're talking red agate, turquoise, jade, and lupus lazuli. It is 35 centimeters tall and has the name of its owner, Badia Munis, engraved in its base like Andy in Toy Story. Number five, Horus and Set. Speaking of Horus, 
earlier. Remember how I said Horus had to take over defending his father? Well, here is where this story begins. When Horus grew up to be a man, he pulled a Hamlet. He was like, you killed my father, prepare to die. Thus a series of battles ensued, and one of the gods didn't play fair. Set kept cheating at everything and continued to come out as victor. Not surprising since he didn't earn his way on the throne, he killed for it, kind of like a certain Claudius. Eventually Isis stepped up to help her son slash nephew overcome her brother. She set a trap for Set, but after some pitiless begging for his own life, she let him go. Horus was pissed, so angry some of the other gods got upset that he was so angry. They agreed to compete in a final boat race and Horus was like crushing it. He was doing really well, he was about to win. But then of course, Set cheated by turning into a hippopotamus and attacked the boat. Therefore claiming victory once again. Osiris finally showed up and declared that no man should take the throne through murder. So Horus took the throne. Why Osiris didn't just settle the whole deal from the beginning is confusing in itself, but hey, kind of reminded me of the eagles that showed at the end of Lord of the Rings that could have saved like three movies, you know? Kind of like that. Anyways, let's move on. Number four, Ra and his boat. Ra is one of the most revered gods in Egyptian mythology, especially since he was the god of the sun. He was depicted as a man with the head of a falcon. That kind of makes sense. He was once the greatest of all gods, but had to take a step back after he got too old and tired, and especially considering his task, I can see why. His job was to drive away darkness and sail across the skies, delivering light wherever he went. But at night, he would dive into the underworld and have to cross 12 gates. 12 hours, an hour per gate. After paying his respect to Osiris every night, a giant snake named Apophis tried to attack and swallow the boat. Every night! Poor guy, no wonder he got worn out. Every day it got harder to defend, and even one night, Apophis succeeded, but could only hold the sunlight for so long. She threw it up, which explained solar eclipses. After Set was cast out after the whole nephew battle, he ended up serving Ra in his boat and kept the snake at bay. But there's something confusing coming later that I think you'll agree is very confusing. So here we go. Coming up next, we have Bass, number three. Have you ever had a cat look you up and down and kind of like expect something? Like worship, you know? Are you a cat person, dog person? Let me know in the comments. Well, that's because cats were a big deal in Egyptian mythology. They even had their own goddess. Bastet was a cat goddess depicted as a woman with a cat's head. Cats had a meaningful role in ancient Egypt as they protected their food from rats and snakes. They were even seen as family members and to harm one was punishable by death. Legend says that sometimes cats would enter burning buildings to save their families. If they died, the goddess would bring them back to life, hence the idea of cats having nine lives. There it is. Now here's where things get confusing. You know that story I told about Ra? Well apparently Bastet was in the boat with him as well. During the day she would ride with him, and at night she would turn into a cat and then defend the boat from Apophis the snake. But I thought that was set. So many conflicting things. I saw like a couple different stories who said, each thing was different, so who knows. Number two, Jeb and Nut. Yet another sibling partnership, we have Jeb and Nut. They fell deeply in love and could never be separated. They were that couple who would like constantly be like, oh my god, stop, right next to each other at dinner, you know what I mean? Jeb was the god of the earth and Nut was the god of the sky. A previously mentioned god, Atum, found their union inappropriate, so he pushed Nut into the sky far away from Jeb. He just didn't like being a third wheel. Jeb and Nut were close enough to see each other but can never hold each other again. And she gave birth to Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Some say Horus too, but I don't think that's true. Number one, the treasure thief. Okay, I don't know how I feel about this story, okay? This doesn't really feel like harmony is in balance, but anyways. The treasure thief ends in a way I really didn't expect and I'm not sure you will either. Long ago, a great pharaoh with a wealth of riches decided to build a pyramid in which to keep them safe. One of the builders was wise to his plan and decided to find a way to claim them for himself. He built a stone vault with a hidden entrance covered by a slab so he could get to the riches. But unfortunately, he fell ill before he could return, so he told his sons of his plan. The sons headed to the pyramid in the dead of night, following their father's order. But unbeknownst to them, the pharaoh had laid booby traps and one brother was caught in one. Not wanting to be found or interrogated, revealing his other brother, he told his brother to chop his head off. Ugh, that he did. Loyalty? I don't know. The pharaoh upon finding the body hung it up in the town square in the hopes of like weeding out whoever it belonged to. But the other brother being so clever got the guards drunk and stole back his brother's body in the dead of night. The pharaoh was like, I'm not even mad. I'm just impressed. He gave the thief a pardon, summoned him to the square 
and gave his daughter to marry him. Yeah, dude, you tried to steal my jewels? Don't worry about it. Have my daughter, because you're so talented at your job. Great work. Kicking off the list at number 10. KB55. Located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KB55, was found by Edward Arden back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason we call this tomb by a number rather than name is because we really don't know who was inside it yet. Even the walls outside of the tomb, they aren't covered with any hieroglyphs to tip us off or give us any hints. It's just bare which is kind of eerie. As you walk down the 20 steps towards KV55, you'll notice markings on the entrance. Markings that show that the entrance was widened since it was first cut, along with its ceilings being raised higher. So whatever was in there needed the room. The only hint as to who was buried remains on the walls. One hieroglyph remains and it was discovered in 1907 and it translates to the evil one that shall not live again. Even these massive stones were built in order to prevent anything from getting out. See, usually with these ancient tombs, it's the opposite. The description for who's inside the tomb had also been destroyed. So we have no idea who or what is in KB55. Number 9, King Teti. The Pyramid of Teti was built for the first ruler of the 6th dynasty, and while it's not flashy or massive as these other pyramids, the insides contain the oldest writing in the religious world. Pretty insane. Now these texts go back to 2400 BC, way back when we used, you know, BBM. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this King Teddy could ascend to the heavens after his death. There are spells and incantations meant to free the king's soul and arrive in the cosmos. More specifically, for Teddy to become a star in the sky and then join Osiris and Orion in the God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to said heavens. World's oldest instruction manual for the win. Number 8. Queen Nefertiti After a scan was done on King Tut's tomb, there were cracks found on the north and earth walls. East. Taylor, east, not earth. There were cracks found on the north and east side walls. So we believe that this is a secret passageway to Queen Nefertiti, the ruler during the 14th century BC, and also wife to King Tut. Queen Nefertiti's parents are also still unknown to this day, so that adds to it. And with ancient texts depicting that these kings and queens would leave Earth and then later return, perhaps they are both descendants of extraterrestrials. And this flying sun disk that they worshipped was not the sun, but rather a winged alien ancestor. Number seven, Dozer. For this one, we're looking into some bull worshipping, so grab your red scarves and start waving them around. Just north of the Step Pyramid of the Pharaoh Doser, archaeologist August Marionette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium is a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. Now, this was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls. They were basically these bulls that were said to be sacred, and after their death, they would become immortal. Remember that, that's important. Today at Saqqara, there's this massive vault. It's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock. It's massive, and along the sides of them are 24 chambers, each with sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Now, inside these boxes were animal remains, just bones and all. But back then, in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. That was a no-go. You had to mummify them. So how are these tombs built, first of all, so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and where do these bones come from? Perhaps these are the remains of the Apis bull. After all, that's the inspiration for the Minotaurs, so maybe alien ancestors looked a lot more jacked than we may think. Number six, dung beetles. This one isn't exactly a pharaoh at all, but it's too good to leave out, especially if we're talking about aliens here. It's important. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way. Think about that for a second. That is... Let's talk about it. Some animals follow the sun. You know, turtles sprint to the ocean the second they're born to avoid getting plucked up by birds. Now these insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their towards it. Literally, their, their poop, they would roll it towards the skies, which is insane. Symbols of these beetles are seen all over, either in hieroglyphics or even in movies, their presence is known. Near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, there is a massive scarab monument. And there's even a legend still to this day behind said statue that if you walk around it nine times, you would find health, wealth, and love. And you'd also probably be a little bit dizzy. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which at the time Egyptians believed was the sun as well. Also known as the scarab face god, which terrifying when you imagine that. Are these bugs just trying to get home into space to their bug alien master? Why does he need so much poop? Whatever DIY project they're working on in the Milky Way probably doesn't smell too good. Number five, 
Luxor tomb. We've been saying 2,500 years ago, and don't get me wrong, that's an awful long time to go, but in 2014, archaeologists discovered a 4,000-year-old tomb from the 11th dynasty, tucked away in Luxor, Egypt, of course, as this list says. Spanish archaeologists found a tomb belonging to a leader from the 11th dynasty, and it's pretty obvious that this was somebody from the royal family or somebody who was a high-ranking official, because at the time, Luxor was the capital city of ancient Egypt, and officials also believe this tomb could have been used as a mass grave. The important thing to note here is that the tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty because tools and utensils from that later time were also found in this grave. We're gonna find a spork in 5,000 years and be like, ah yes, ancient tools, interesting. Number four. 210 sarcophagi. So we thought it was a pretty big deal when 160 bodies were recently discovered in Egypt. This was back in September 2020. Over 160 coffins were found. Wild, right? Well, those are rookie numbers, turns out. For this one, archaeologists found 210 sarcophagi near Queen Nefertiti's funerary temple in the city of the dead, Saqqara. Yeah, there were over 160, surprise. Maybe next time you check in with us, that number will be even higher. Who knows? Hopefully, slash maybe hopefully not. I don't know how I feel about this. This was January 2020. We probably would have seen it on the news, but that was when 768 people were storming the capital, so the news was a bit busy, I guess. Thanks. These sealed coffins were untouched for thousands of years. They went from finding 160 to finding 210. That's incredible. According to the ministry, the sarcophagi were completely closed and haven't been opened since they were buried at all. They opened a few though, of course, just to analyze and display them, but that's it. Yeah, leave the rest. I'm not focused on ancient curses or Brennan Fraser having to come out and save the day. Just let dead people lay where they are. Let them rest. The amount of effort got into hiding and preserving their memory alone. I mean, look how long it's taken for us to even find these things. It's almost like they didn't want to be found. Number three, the ancient curse. The walls of some of these tombs have warnings from the gods, which is a lot. One of them warning trespassers that the gods will wring their neck like that of a goose. Also, if I walked into somebody's property now and it said trespassers' necks will be wrung out like a goose, I would turn back. I wouldn't want to investigate further. I would just walk away. You don't need to be an ancient god to get that message across, you know what I mean? But inside the found tomb of the vizier Ankhamor, a pharaoh's official from 4,000 years ago, a curse was written. Buried in a mastaba, an above ground massive tomb, was this warning. Might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It also warns of the vizier's knowledge of secret spells and magic, and threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing a ghost. Yeah, there's that or beware of dog. I don't know, you can pick which is more impactful on your property, sure. Number two, the animal tombs. This tomb was found, as you may have guessed, in the Valley of the Kings. You're getting good, nice. But this one doesn't sound like the rest. I mean, for starters, it's a number rather than a name. What in the Elon Musk is happening here? Whose name was a number, huh? KV-52 was discovered in 1906 by Edward Ayrton. Tomb KV-50, KV-51, and this one, KV-52, they all form a group referred to as the animal tombs. Underneath six feet of debris, the entrance to these vaults were found, so when we enter this tomb, specifically KV-52, that's been untouched, ideally, for thousands of years, we can look forward to finding anything. In fact, whatever we do find, it's a win. It helps complete this age-long puzzle. So when officials opened KV-52 and it was completely empty, well, that doesn't feel too nice. Something here is wrong. It was empty except for two boxes. Both were black and undecorated, which is odd considering what we've learned on this list. The larger of the two contained the remains of a monkey, and the smaller one was a canopic chest that had four compartments in it. Hauntingly bare compared to what else we've seen on this list, but it gets a little better. We're not done yet. Finally, number one, Queen Nefertiti's hidden chamber. When researchers are 90% sure about something, that's a pretty good sign. You only say you're 90% sure of something when you know for sure, for sure. You leave 10% in case anything else goes wrong out of your control, right? 90%, that's confident, we got this. So when Egyptian authorities said they're 90% sure there's a hidden chamber in King Tut's tomb, well, we got a little jazzed, a little, got some jazz hands going on. Not gold, jazz hands. Back in 2015, a paper was published on the burial of Queen Nefertiti. Archaeologist Nicholas Reeves argued that while conducting scans on the ancient site, Reeves found what resembled traces of doors beneath the plaster. Now, it's been considered previously by archaeologists that King Tut's mask, having ear piercings and all, suggests that at that time, that tomb and that death mask was actually meant for Queen Nefertiti, not King Tut. But because King Tut died suddenly when he was 19, plans had to quickly change. 90% sure is good enough for me. What do you guys think? Comment down below all your thoughts. Number 10, Tutankhamun. This guy is arguably the most famous Egyptian pharaoh. So what is he doing at the top of the list? Well, King Tut wasn't famous for anything he really did in his lifetime. 
I mean, he was a young pharaoh, but someone on this list was technically pharaoh since he was two. No, he wasn't famous for anything he really did. Instead, Tutankhamun's tomb, discovered in 1922, was one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever. It was almost entirely intact, and his sarcophagus was incredible. Tutankhamun only lived to the age of 20, and how he lost the spark of life is actually still a mystery. He may not have done much other than a lot of religious reforms, but he managed to find another way of living forever. Number 9. Djoser So, with King Tut, he didn't really do much in his short lifetime. With Djoser, we actually don't really know a lot of what he did. Also like Tutankhamun, it was what he did for and after his departure from life that made him famous. Djoser was responsible for the construction of the limestone steppe pyramid at Saqqara, the first of its kind. It was a huge architectural achievement. A building that stays structurally sound no matter how big it gets? Well, knock me down and call me Susan. The pyramid was actually completed after he lost the will to live by his official Imhotep. Number 8. Amenhotep III Okay, on to the members of the list who we know did something significant for Egypt during their time on the earth. Amenhotep III ruled an artistically and financially successful Egypt. He had pretty stellar reviews on Google for his trade relations which boosted up the economy of Egypt, but it was his artistic side that got him a bit more of a lasting recognition. He is the pharaoh with the most statues of himself. He created tons of monuments and a lot of stone scarabs that still hold up with tons of stories of historical events. I want some statues myself. Is, is that weird? Probably. Number 7. Hatshepsut Now look, women in Egypt had high status and were respected more than in other parts of the world at the time. But a female pharaoh, while not unheard of, was unfortunately still pretty rare. Hatshepsut here was known as the most successful of those female pharaohs. Her father, King Thutmose I, wanted her to inherit the throne, and to that end, she was brought up learning how to lead. She reigned for 21 years after the death of her husband, and everything she did, from tons of construction projects to creating trade routes, went off without a single hitch. The people of Egypt lived in peace for her entire rule. Number 6. Thutmose III Thutmose III was, surprisingly, the son of Thutmose II, who was the husband of Hatshepsut. You know, number seven, the most successful female pharaoh. So that's the kind of cloth we're working with here. Thutmose was only two when his father bit the dust. So while he was technically the next pharaoh, his stepmother took over with him as co-ruler. This guy's contributions to the Egyptians were tremendous, though. He was literally called the Napoleon of Egypt, which... Shouldn't Napoleon be the Thutmose the Third of France? Either way, Thutmose the Third. He helped expand Egypt like none before. He was a dope warrior, and he helped in the construction of a lot of stuff. Most importantly, the Temple of Karnak. That's how you make Mama proud. Number five, honey coated. Who here hates bugs bothering them in the summer? Unless they're a bumblebee, because we love bumblebees here, right guys? But me too. No one likes the buzzing of blood suckers nipping at your skin while you're chilling out on the beach or barbecue. Well, guess what? Egyptian pharaohs hated it too, except they didn't have bug spray. So what did they do? Well, you know the phrase, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? Well, they took that literally. Conveniently, they had servants around them at all times, so to help with the bug problem, they covered them with honey so as to distract the bees and the bugs. So as the pharaohs lounged on the sand, or wherever they were, their dutiful servants took on the job of taking on the bug bites. King Pepe, for instance, had a dedicated slave in his entourage who endured it every day. Poor guy. It was so effective that he had one designated in each room. Poor guys. Number four, assassins. This wasn't necessarily something that he did, but something that happened to him that was pretty messed up. As you can guess from the title, it involved assassins. Ramses III had a lot on his plate during his reign. There were this group of seafarers trying to destroy everyone. The tomb builders did their first labor strike over wage delays. I get you. The economy was deteriorating. Weather was devastating food production. Things were corrupt as hell. And on top of all this, his secondary wife, T.A., hated his guts. She, along with a dozen members of his harem, the head of the treasury, a military captain, a butler, the butler did it, and the chief royal 
Chamberlain hatched an assassination plot. In 2012, researchers used a high powered CT scanner on Ramsey's mummy and saw a massive throat gash covered by an amulet said to have healing powers. The researchers summarized that an assassin cut through Ramsey's esophagus and trachea, killing him practically instantly because he probably would have just let out that fast. Some other research suggests that this happened before the other assassination plot unraveled, but either way, not a good way to go. Number 3. Till death do us part. Remember that thing I mentioned at the beginning? Well. If you were a servant to a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, you were hoping that your dude lived a long time because once they bite the dust, so did you. Now keep in mind, ancient Egyptians believed strongly in the afterlife. So when you died, you didn't just disappear, you literally just traveled to another world. That's the whole idea behind religion anyway. The discovery team organized by NYU, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania discovered macabre evidence of this tradition. While excavating the mortuary ritual site of Pharaoh Aha, they found six graves not far from his tomb. They were skeletons of court officials, servants, artisans who appear to have been sacrificed to serve the pharaoh in the afterlife. Aha's successor, Dajir, had more than 200, which are also presumed to be sacrificial burials as well. Number two, Marrying your siblings. Again, remember the thing I mentioned before and now I'm actually getting to it? I promised, I promised, and here we are. Not so long ago, it was normal to court your very own cousin, but today that would be considered a very large taboo. I'm not gonna lie, it gives me the skippies, okay? I don't like imagining ma even marrying any of my cousins, that's weird to me. But the ancient Egyptians took things even farther, or should I say brought it closer, by marrying their very own siblings. Hey. That's one way to guarantee that the line will stay in the family. But knowing what we know about the genetic pool being too close and the complications that can arise, there's things that can go wrong. But nevertheless, it happened. DNA testing from King Tut's corpse revealed that he was a product of a union between two siblings. Pharaohs believed that they were descended from the gods. Therefore, keeping it in the family was crucial in maintaining that bloodline. King Tut even married his own half-sister, same dad, when he was just 10 years old. However, generations of inbreeding resulted in a bone disease that got more severe each time. Cleopatra also married her own brother as well. That was a that was a whole thing, and then she met Caesar and that whole thing we talked about, yeah. That thing. Let's move on. Number one, Akhenaten. One of the most polarizing figures in Egyptian history, Akhenaten tried to get rid of religion and as a result, they got rid of him. Akhenaten earned the title of heretic king and a recent discovery has revealed that his deeds might have been a lot darker. Akhenaten came to power in the 1350s and reigned for around 17 years. He is known for creating a new religion surrounding Aten, who was generally represented as a sun disk. Sometime around his fourth year, he started sending out agents to erase names and images of certain gods from existing texts and monuments. Around the fifth year, he claimed to discover the location of the new royal city and moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Akhetaten, today known as Tel El Amarna. There, his people suffered greatly under slave labor, with bodies being uncovered younger than 20, many with bones broken, spines broken, along with evidence of severe malnutrition. When the pharaoh finally passed, his tomb remained unfinished and his name was stricken from the history books. At least now, we can see why. Kicking off the list at number 10, got a passport. Ramses II is known as one of the greatest ancient Egyptian rulers of all time. He was called Ramses the Great, so that's a good sign already. At a young age, he fought in harsh battles to protect the borders of Egypt, and during his reign, the Egyptian army reached 100,000 men. That's a pretty large army. He was later referred to as the Great Ancestor, and it didn't take long for Ramses II to declare himself a god. It's always fun being like, hey, by the way, I'm a god now. That's how cool I am. 30 years into his ruling, Ramses was ritually turned into an Egyptian god. It was a formal thing. Though it wasn't until 3,000 years later until Ramses would truly soar through the skies. He was buried in his treasure after 96 years of living, and in 1974, he finally started to show signs of aging. Not too bad. He went from being on display to being sent to Paris to get a glow up, you know, to preserve the king's body even longer. Instead of being listed as luggage on the way to Paris, the pharaoh was given an official Egyptian passport for the commute. The government gave a mummy a passport. This is like the first five minutes of a horror film. Under occupation, it even said king. And there was even a small disclaimer noting that he was in fact still dead. You can never be too sure, you know? Number nine. Baboon tattoos. Ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. This is common knowledge now at this point. We've heard about their love towards cats, which I'll explain later on, but what about baboons? 
Yeah, they were pretty important pieces to this ancient puzzle as well. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. Now, one of the most strange things that pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Imagine stealing a pair for your family and then four baboons start doing parkour, chasing you down. That's so alarming. I would just throw it and be like, please stop. You're so scary and strong. They train baboons to pick fruit, they train them to make beer, and they also train them to entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to tattoo one on my arm. So you know what? I get it. Get a Harambe tattoo. I'm like, you know, I, it's, I, I see it. I see the similarities. Number eight, worship dung beetles. So worshiping a baboon that dances and makes holiday ales, yeah, I can see how one would worship such a creature. That makes sense. But pharaohs also worship dung beetles and their reasoning may surprise you. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way naturally. Animals are born with natural instincts. Sea turtles race to the sea. These guys follow the cosmos. It's pretty wild. It's one thing to follow the sun naturally because it gives off warmth. Sunflowers will literally turn their head to find the sun, which is super creepy, but it's beautiful. These insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their poop towards it. They'd be like, hello Milky Way, and they just... Hieroglyphs of these beetles are seen all over. Like near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, for example, there's a massive scarab monument. And today, if you walk around it nine times, you get good luck. And don't worry, you don't have to roll any droppings at the same time. Don't get dizzy, that's all, it's the only rule. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which ancient Egyptians believed was the sun. I grew up thinking the sun was a baby, but that's because I watched Teletubbies, so, you know, depends. Number seven, surprise each other. Cleopatra and Julius Caesar were a pretty beneficial couple, to say the least. Cleopatra would use Caesar's armies, which in turn would allow her to rule Egypt, while Caesar was eyeing down Cleopatra's extreme wealth. They were the perfect pair. She was able to financially support Caesar enough for him to return to power back in Rome, but how did such a perfect pair meet in the first place? Did Cleopatra swipe right? Hmm, no. Well, a then 52-year-old Julius Caesar visited the much younger Cleopatra, so she then sent a surprise gift to his chambers. She got her crew to roll her up in a carpet or bed sheets, it's not really confirmed, something along those lines, and then delivered her to his door completely nude. He unraveled a naked Cleopatra, and he's like, okay, hello. That's pretty impressive. Cleopatra was down for fun surprises. While we don't recommend this as an approach ever, it's one worth mentioning on our list. Number six, gender reveal parties. We've all seen those videos. A guy goes to hit a baseball, he misses it, the baseball breaks and there's pink dust all around his feet and he starts crying, it's wonderful. Gender reveal parties were quite popular, you know, until they started lighting wildfires. But back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. Instead of peeing on a pregnancy test, you would have to use wheat and barley seeds instead. Depending on how those barley crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. They were right 85% of the time, which is quite impressive back in the day. We went from watering crops to burning them. Hashtag, it's a boy. Number five, bloodletting. The practice of bloodletting was common all over the world, but it may have gotten its start in ancient Egypt. It's a quite simple procedure, really. Black bile out of whack? Lose some blood. Can't stop coughing and sneezing? Drain some blood. Been possessed by demons and now they curse and haunt you as they run up and down your bloodstream? Drain some blood. The question is, however, was this really helping? The short answer, no. No, it wasn't. Besides feeling lightheaded and going pale, this didn't really achieve much. Since the days of old were filled with all kinds of other ailments that would easily end someone's life before the spooky demons running up and down someone's bloodstream ever would. I don't feel good. Oh, we better bleed grandpa again. I don't know. Like what? Number four, plastic surgery. Hey, there's nothing wrong with a little cosmetic surgery. I for one feel that if it'll make you feel better, go for it. Feel better about yourself. Do it. I don't think there's any shame in that. It's been around for a long time, so long that ancient Egyptians might have come up with the first nose jobs. Obviously not like the ones today, but they were knowledgeable in surgeries. After all, you open the chest cavity of a dozen kings and you jot some stuff down on some papyrus, you learn a thing or two. More interesting than shaving down your own beak, however, was their implementation of the prosthesis limbs. Yes, all the way back then. One mummy was actually found with a fake toe. When tested in the modern day with period accurate sandals, it proved to work quite well and move more efficiently than first thought. Again, for the time, this was pretty advanced. Number three, the Ode of the Nile. Imagine people working all day in the blistering sands of Egypt, where the sun beams down on you like well, the sun in the desert. 
lifting massive rocks and carving them to shape. I don't know about you guys, but I would be sweating. And that also means I wouldn't be smelling too fresh. Resembling that of a high school locker room. Yuck. Well, the Egyptians knew this was an issue, so they came up with what was probably the first underarm deodorant. Using nice herbs and other items that had pleasant aromas, and stuck them where the odor was coming from. In ya bits. I just know that after a long day of hard labor in the sun, I would need more than cinnamon sticks and lavender to tame the odor of my sweaty lumberjack armpits. That's just how it goes. Number 2. The Egyptian Brazilian The 70s have come and gone, and a popular trend today is to be hairless. Everywhere. Even in places where you didn't think it was possible to grow hair when you were younger. Egyptians took it upon themselves to remove all their hair. Well, at least most of it. Not because the Nile River had nice beaches, but because of lice. Oh, yuck. While not an exact cure for the itchy bugs that plague schools across America, it did seem to help. And if you've ever had lice before, you know how bad that sucks. I had them once, it was the worst. She cut my hair, shaped, shaved my head, lots of baths. Just, it's, it's no fun, man. Too cute for that, I don't want that. Number one. Wario breath. Wow. Okay. It makes sense that Egyptians would come up with breath mints and mouthwash. They fed their laborers diets of foods that contained a lot of onions and garlic. Sure, I'm just like everyone else who cooks. And when the recipe asks for one onion, eh, maybe I put in two. When it asks for two cloves of garlic, maybe I put in four. You gotta love that flavor. It was thought that they helped fight off disease and. They were kind of right. However, after eating all that flavor, your breath would be something rancid. So herbs and mints were used to help quell the breath that could peel the paint off of walls. Number 10 on our countdown, the wax crocodile will be presented in a story form. Once upon a time, as all good stories begin, a pharaoh, accompanied by his counselors and servants, paid a visit to the villa of his chief scribe, behind which there was a garden with a stately summer house and a broad artificial lake. One of the servants of the pharaoh was a handsome young man who catches the eye of the scribe's wife. She sends him gifts, and they begin to have secret meetings at the summer house and swim in its lake. The chief butler informs the scribe of his wife's affair, and the scribe in turn asks the butler to bring him a magic box. In Inside was a small wax crocodile that he placed in the hands of his butler saying, cast this image into the lake behind the youth when he next bathes himself. The lovers were together in the lake the next day and the butler stealthily put the wax croc into the water, which immediately gave it life. It became a great crocodile that seized the handsome man suddenly and took him away. Seven days passed and the scribe tells the pharaoh of the wonder that had been done and made a request his majesty should accompany him to the villa lake. The pharaoh did so and when they both stood beside the lake in the garden, the scribe spoke magic words bidding the crocodile to appear and as he commanded so did it do. The great reptile came out of the water carrying the handsome man in its jaws. The pharaohs filled with wonder and the scribe related on to him what had happened while the handsome man stood waiting. Could have taken his chance to run but I guess not. The pharaoh bids on to the crocodile once again to take the handsome man into the depths and neither are ever seen again. Then the pharaoh gave the command that the wife of the scribe should be seized and on the north side of the house she was bound to a stake and burned alive. Now if you want to hear more wild stories like this I recommend you subscribe to the hive. For number 9, let's talk about the lore of the Catwoman God. Cats were very important to the ancient Egyptians and were even considered to be demi-deities. Not only did they protect the crops and slow the spread of disease by killing rodents, but they were also thought to be the physical form of the goddess Beset. The Egyptian goddess of domesticity, childbirth, the home, women's secrets, women's physical pleasure, fertility, and of course, cats. It's for this reason she's depicted as a slender and lanky woman with a cat's head. Beset was the daughter of Ra, the sister of Sekhemet, the wife of Ptah and the mother of Mihos. It's believed that every day she would ride through the sky with her father, the sun god, and watch over and protect him. At night she would turn into a cat and continue her duty of protecting Gra, but from his greatest enemy, the serpent Apep. And since we're already talking about it, number 8 will be the serpent Apep. According to the legend, Apep was a powerful serpent deity who resided in the underworld and embodied the universe's destruction and chaos. Each night when Ra's son Bo had to pass through the underworld before before re-emerging at dawn, a pep would absolutely hound the ship in an attempt to prevent the sun from rising. Ra, the sun god and king of the gods, fought a pep every night, and the battle was always extremely intense, required all the other gods' help, and lasted the whole night. So to aid Ra in battle, the Egyptians would build wax representations of a pep and 
melt them in the sun. Finally, it's Beset who conquers and destroys the serpent Apep. During one of these nightly battles, Beset, being the goddess of cats, Aiden and Apep's defeat by utilizing her powers in a different way than she'd done before. Assuming the form of a lioness, she jumps the serpent, shredding him to pieces and scattering the bones over the underworld. From then on, Ra was tormented nightly no longer. For number seven, you're going to hear the oldest origin of Cinderella and her red slipper. Rhodopis, as she's known to modern storytellers, was a Thradican Egyptian woman slighted by fate and rewarded by royalty. First sold in Aegea, Rhodopis is passed through owners before winding up in Egypt. The Egyptian man who possesses her treats her incredibly fair. He gives her lovely homes, lavish her with other gifts, but he spent most of his time sleeping. So she's sitting on the bank of the Canopic Nile, watching robes when a falcon suddenly snatches her sandal. Rhodopis is in awe, for she knew it was the god Horus who had taken her shoe, but wondering what the Horus appearance could mean. Unbeknownst to her, however, the falcon had taken it to Memphis and dropped the sandal in the lap of none other than the pharaoh Amasis himself. Possessed by the sandal's simplicity, but beautiful red color and being an obvious sign from the god Horus, the king sent his men in all directions of the country's quest of all directions of the country in quest of the woman who wore it. According to Greek geographer and historian Strabo in his geography book 17.33, she was found in the city of Nocritus. Hearing the trumpets and gongs of the emperor, she had hidden in the bushes while other girls tried to force their feet into her sandal. But the emperor spots her and requests she come out and try it. Naturally, Cinderella style, it only fits her, and she pulled the matching one from her robes. The pharaoh and Rhodopis are united by the god Horus, and the servant girl becomes the next queen of Egypt, to whom Herodotus, Diodorus, and Strabo say the third pyramid of Giza was attributed to. For number six, we're getting another Grecian influenced myth, that of Oedipus and the Sphinx. So the legend of the Sphinx is a famous Egyptian myth about a creature with the head of a human woman and the body of a lion. Sometimes the Sphinx is also depicted to have wings, but that's more of a Greco-Roman component. According to the story, the Sphinx was said to have been sent by the sun god Ra to guard the entrance of the city of Thebes. The Sphinx naturally, as you may know, guarded Thebes not only with its might, but with its mind, presenting a riddle for all those who approached it. And to anyone who could not answer the riddle, they would be killed. What was the riddle? What walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening? If you don't know the answer yet, I actually encourage you to pause the video and try some guesses before we continue. Let's see if the Sphinx would give you the slice and dice. Okay, so the answer is, drum roll please, a human who crawls on all fours as a baby, walks on two legs as an adult, and uses a cane in old age. Tricky, right? So the myth goes that a young prince named Oedipus, yes, the one who marries and does stuff with his mom, uh, came upon the Sphinx while traveling and he asked the riddle. Oedipus was the first person to be able to answer correctly, which angered and confused the crap out of the Sphinx, causing it to take its own life in a panic. However, some versions of the myth, the Sphinx was said to have been turned to stone by the gods. Number five, we love cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still go for it. I still pet them. I risk everything just to, yes, I don't care. I ruined my entire weekend just to get my face all up in their whiskers. Nobody did it like ancient Egyptians. You've probably heard this at one point or another. They worshipped cats. They were like, you know, the legendary <laughs> cats. That was, that was their thing. I'm more of a golden retriever guy, but I get it. They're cute. They respected them. They worshipped them. Even though at the time, dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. It's because they just stare at shit randomly. Mid-conversation, a cat will just be like... No, they're not magical, they're terrifying. They're on something. If you had a cat, you had good luck, apparently. A friend of mine has two fat cats. He has some pretty good luck, I think. If they're fat, they're good? Hmm. When a cat passed away back in ancient Egyptian times, they too were mummified. You would think that alone was just plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs, they would obviously go a step further. Hence this fun list. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and would mourn them until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. That's, I, I got over my childhood animal in like six business days. It's not a bad thing, it's just that's a long time, you know? Next time your friend tells you their cat passed away, tell them if they really loved them, they would shave their eyebrows. Test them. Number four, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, well, all the pharaohs were considered kings, but it was equal at the time. And they all look athletic. They all look like these warriors, right? They look to be in great shape. When in reality, a lot of these pharaohs were probably pretty overweight or unhealthy. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day, plus a little dab of honey every eight minutes, you're gonna gain some weight. Yeah, that's how it goes. Many of these ancient pharaohs did have diabetes, and Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong and all that jazz, but almost all historians agree that she was out of shape and quite unhealthy. Honestly, fair. I would do the exact same thing. She was ahead of her time. If somebody was like, hey, I'm gonna make a statue for you. What should I make it look like? I'm like, 
yeah, give them an eight pack. Make them jacked, I don't know. Make them look like Michael Jordan, I don't know. Number three, gender reveal parties. Okay, we've seen all these videos online. A guy goes to swing and hit a baseball. He misses, it hits the ground. There's a big pink cloud of smoke. Everyone's like, oh my God. Gender reveal parties, right? They're pretty popular. Turns out they're popular back in ancient Egyptian days, but nobody did it like them. Also, nobody started any wildfires back then when any uh, ancient Egyptians did it, so that's nice. We should go take a note from them. Back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. You would have to use wheat and barley seeds. You would have to pee on them. And then, however it grew, that would determine the sex. I would feel bad. First of all, I'd be like, hi, we're curious. Don't mind us. I'm just gonna pee on your crops, sir. Let us know how it grows. We're really aiming towards a boy this time. We have 96 girls, so we're gonna try a couple of boys. Yeah, depending on how the crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. And it worked a lot of the time. It's pretty wild. We went from watering crops to burning them down just to find out a gender. Hashtag it's a boy. Number two, more tattoos. More tattoos for number two. We love it. You guys saw what I did. Ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. We talked about that, the whole cat stuff and the whole hippo situation in part one, that was violent. But what about baboons? Did they get any love? Baboons, I say it weird, baboons, baboons. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. One of the most strange things pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Yep, stop resisting, you're going to jail. Me and seven baboons, let's carry them into the car, bam. Imagine stealing food for your family just to like try and get by and four baboons pop out, start doing parkour, and then arrest you in front of everyone. That'd be so embarrassing and also alarming. They trained baboons to pick fruit, make beer, and even entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party, apparently. If their dance moves alone would be reason enough to get a tattoo of one of my arms, honestly. Going all crazy, throwing their own at people, I'd be like, yeah, right here or here. I don't care. And finally, number one, the afterlife. One of the most fascinating parts about these ancient Egyptian pharaohs is that they would pass away literally covered in gold, head to toe. It's nice to know that this long ago, some of these kings and queens still rest untouched by grave robbers or explorers. The afterlife for these pharaohs was important. And as soon as they take on the throne, work is immediately underway on their tomb. That's a little grim when you think about it. It's like, hey, congratulations. We're gonna start making where you're gonna be buried. It's like. Thanks, I think. These monuments took time, but they were built to last, and clearly, they have. Pharaoh's eyes were painted black with coal. They did this so that they would look like the god Horus after they passed on. 